All right, welcome everyone to Grow Local, Home Gardening and Community Agriculture. This is the fourth webinar in an ongoing series being put on by Sustainable Resilient Longmont's Zero Waste Committee. Sustainable Resilient Longmont is a nonprofit organization that collaborates with the Longmont community to cultivate a sustainable and thriving city through education, advocacy, and action. We have three main programs of focus. We put on the annual Longmont Earth Day celebration, which is coming up later this month on Saturday, April 24th. We work to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2030 for the city of Longmont. And we advocate for the Longmont community to move towards becoming zero waste. My name is Naomi Curland, and I'm the chair of the Zero Waste Committee for SRL, as well as the executive director of Longmont Food Rescue. Advocating for resilient and sustainable local food systems has been part of my work for over a decade, and I am excited to hear from our impressive lineup of panelists about how to, particip how to participate in community agriculture today. First, James Lissy is going to share some tips about home gardening in the Front Range area. James started off knowing absolutely nothing about growing vegetables when he turned his backyard into an urban farm, but in a few short years, he's enjoying tons of homegrown produce. Even this spring, he's still eating food from his bountiful 2020 growing season. He writes about his backyard adventures in his column, Get Growing, for the Longmont Leader, as well as on his blog, grasstoveggies.com, which has a free guide showing you how you can grow your own food. After James, we'll hear from Tim Villard, the food project manager at Growing Gardens, and also a board member for Sustainable Resilient Longmont. Tim is passionate about growing healthy food and managing sustainable landscapes that support people and local ecology. That passion has led him to spend the last 10 years working on local organic farms in Boulder County, installing xeric and native landscapes on the Front Range, and managing school vegetable gardens. Next, Sonia Hefley will be provi will providing perspective from the local farm level, educating us on growing practices at Aspen Moon Farm and community supported agriculture. Sonia majored in soil and crop sciences from Colorado State University and spent three years after graduation working in Peace Corps Panama in agriculture and farmers group management. This is her second season with Aspen Moon Farm. Last fall, she worked as the farm stand manager, and this year, Sonia is the planting crew lead and is excited to be growing veggies for the community. Our final panelist, Brian Copham, will share a little about our farmers markets, how they're operating this year, and the importance of supporting local agriculture. Brian has been the executive director of Boulder County Farmers Markets since the flood of 2013. BCFM is a farmer governed nonprofit with a mission of supporting local agriculture. It now operates five on-street markets and an online ordering operation that conducts curbside pickups in Longmont, Boulder, Lafayette, and Denver. Welcome to all our panelists and our attendees. Before we get started, uh, I would like to mention that we have our Q&A open at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So if you'd like to ask a question of our panelists, please type it into the pop-up Q&A box and we'll have time to discuss some of your questions after our panelist presentations. All right, so James, why don't you kick things off with an intro to home gardening? Sounds good, thank you, Naomi. Let me share my screen here. There we go. So thank you again. My name is James Lissy, and thank you for joining today. I hope you're as excited as I am to hear from everybody tonight to learn more about home gardening and local agriculture. Today I'm going to be talking to you about when you should be planting the different types of plants on the Front Range in Colorado. Before we get into that, let me tell you a little bit about myself. As I said, my name is James. I live in Longmont, and I grow my own food in my backyard. I write about my food growing adventures in my column for Longmont Leader called Get Growing and also on my blog, grasstoveggies.com, both of which are free resources for you, showing you exactly how I am able to grow my own food and how you can do it too. When I first bought my home in Longmont, this is what my backyard looked like. So pretty desolate, whole lot of weeds back there. There's a stump, 
a place that not a lot going on, but it was full of opportunity. Three years later, this is the exact same yard. This is taken from a different corner of the yard, but it's a vegetable oasis. There's corn, squash, tomatoes, peppers, over a thousand sunflowers. And this is last year. This is an aerial view. Same thing, there's over 18 cabbages here. There's fava beans, dill, echinacea, still a whole bunch of sunflowers. So there's quite a lot you can do with the space you have available to you at your house, property, or even the balcony of your apartment. Even if the space seems small and insignificant, you can probably utilize it to grow some food. Each type of plant has very specific conditions that it likes to grow in. They can certainly grow outside of these conditions, but they might not like it as much, and thus they might not taste as good. Think of this as if you lived in Hawaii and you had grown very accustomed to the nice, sunny, and comfortable weather. You like lounging around in your Hawaiian shirt. You like going into the ocean that's just like bath water. You like laying on your beach with a Mai Tai. Who doesn't? This is your optimal living condition that you have grown accustomed to. If someone suddenly put you on a plane and dropped you off in Antarctica, you're not gonna be comfortable and you're going to freak out. You can live there, but you're not gonna be happy about it. Plants are the same way. Each one has their own idea of what their Hawaii is, and it's your job as a gardener to discover what that is for each plant in order for you to grow vegetables in their most optimal conditions so you can get the tastiest end product at the end of your hard work. In the spring, which is right now, we want to plant our cold loving plants. These are typically your lettuces, spinach, arugula, radishes, snow peas, chard, bok choy, tatsoi, kale, mizuna, sorrel, cabbage, onions, carrots. If you don't know what some of these are, don't worry. You're right up there with the vast majority of people, but you should look into them and see, you know, try them out, see how you like them. Sorrel is one of my favorites. It's a lemon tasting green and it is very delicious on salads and just anything you put it on. So these are all of your cold loving plants. They love the crisp, cool nights and warm days. These all need to be planted right now. In Colorado, the weather is so unpredictable and it's common for the weather to go from cold to really warm without much in between. So these types of plants can be very challenging to grow out here. Their idea of Hawaii is the nice cool weather. And if you grow them in the cool spring conditions, they will be very sweet tasting. Once it starts getting really warm outside, they will start bolting, which is basically when they have been dropped off in their Antarctica. They aren't comfortable anymore. They're done with it. So they start producing seeds, which is what bolting is. And they literally grow really tall, really fast to spread their seeds out. Once these greens start bolting, their taste changes dramatically and they will get really bitter. The radishes get hard and woody and they just don't taste good anymore. So these all need to be grown in the cool weather before it gets warm. Plant them now or look for them soon at the farmer's market, your CSA, or your favorite local farm. These will all be hitting the stands shortly if they're not already there. Next, we have our summer plants. These are the plants that love the heat and they hate the cold. So you have your peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, watermelons, squash, beans, corn, herbs, most flowers, these are the plants that you don't want to plant until after the last frost. Mother's Day is a good general indicator for this, but you do have to be careful with that. It can, it has before, and it will again snow after Mother's Day, which will kill your summer plants. You have to keep an eye on the weather and just see what it's doing. If it's early to mid-May and the low at night is well away from freezing, then you should be fine to plant these vegetables. The kicker here is we don't have a long growing season and some of these plants take forever to grow. Peppers and eggplants are the main culprits on this list. If you haven't already started these inside from seed, then you'll need to buy seedlings. Otherwise, you won't get any actual fruit. You can still plant the plants whenever you want, but unless you started them way in advance, you won't get the fruit from them. The rest of them, including tomatoes, you can start outside 
I usually jumpstart the tomatoes inside before the last frost so I can try and get tomatoes as early as possible, but they love the heat. So they're hard to start unless you have a really warm space such as a greenhouse. They don't fare well in my basement. Then we're back to the cooler weather for the fall. As the weather starts getting colder in August, you can start planting your fall crops again that love that cool weather. This time we're starting with warm weather though and getting cooler. So growing the cool loving plants in the fall is tough with our unpredictable weather. You might want to plant the, you know, you might end up planting the cool weather plants. They start sprouting and suddenly it's back to 90 degree weather for two weeks and all of your plants bolt. However, there are some plants that like starting with the heat and getting colder. The Chinese red meat radishes, those are the main ones that I grow that fall into that category. These are also known as watermelon radishes. They're very delicious. You can also plant pumpkins, plus all the normal cool loving plants that you grew in the spring. Pumpkins, they grow very fast and they can deal with some cool weather. So you can get away with planting them midsummer and still getting some squash from them. I usually still plant them in the spring though, directly after the last frost. So they have as much growing time as possible. Keep in mind that this is all very general. Within each type of vegetable, you have different varieties and each variety can vary wildly for what it likes. Just try and find each plant's Hawaii and use your resources to help you with this. Go to the farmer's market, talk to farmers that grow food the way you want it to be grown, see what they have available, buy unusual varieties and just see what you like. Or find a CSA at a farm that has growing practices that align with what you want to support buy into that CSA and learn from that farm and volunteer at that farm. We have so many farms around us with an incredible wealth of knowledge. Use all of that to help you learn as well as to have the lowest carbon footprint possible and to keep your food tasting good as well as to support local families on the front range. Feel free to check out my Longmont Leader column or my blog if you'd like more free resources. Again, I'm James and thank you for joining me. Awesome. Thank you, James. I loved your analogy and I loved seeing the before and after pictures of your backyard. That was so impressive. It's very inspiring stuff. Um, just a reminder that if attendees have uh, home gardening questions for James, you can use the Q&A form uh, at the bottom of your screen and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the presentations. Um, and then we've just dropped some links into the chat that James mentioned um, to learn more about his home gardening uh, and tips. So up next, we have Tim with Growing Gardens to share a little about their community programs. All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Naomi, thanks as well. Um, let me jump in and share my screen here. Let's see. All right. and. Jump into presentation mode. Okay. So uh, yeah, hey everyone, my name is Tim Villard. I work with Growing Gardens. Um, their mission is to cultivate community through actually sustainable agriculture. Um, and although this is a Boulder based organization, um, I actually live in Longmont. I'm a Longmont resident and I work exclusively in Longmont. So um, I'm gonna focus my presentation today really on the programs that I manage and the opportunities and everything that's going on in Longmont with Growing Gardens. So, um, uh, and then also right here, you can see that I do work on a farm, which I'll get into in a second. The address is 950 Lashley Street. And really it's a collaboration between Growing Gardens and the YMCA of Northern Colorado. Um, see here. Okay, so the my role as the food project manager is to manage Grand Gardens food project. Um, the mission of the food project, which is one of our programs, is to promote health and self-sufficiency throughout Boulder County by increasing access to fresh food, seeds, plant starts, and gardening education and resources for low-income community members. So um, through this program last year, we donated 37,000 plant starts uh, to low-income families in 
and individuals uh, in Boulder County, and then also 4,400 seed packets. Um, additionally, through the farm that I'm managing this year, we donated over 18,000 pounds of fresh food and produce. So the food project and food project farm programs that I'm gonna talk about here are, we have seed and seedling donations. We have classroom and community education. There is the food project farm and then the Cultiva Youth Project. So starting with seed and seedling donations, um, this is happening right now. This is, um, so if you want to participate, uh, you can sign up. I've shared sign up links in um, the resources that Naomi is going to share afterwards. And you also have my contact information so you can reach out directly to me. Um, but again, these seeds and seedlings are available to low income families and individuals. And we also work with other organizations who work with low income families and individuals to distribute these seeds and seedlings uh, throughout Boulder County. If you want to participate, you can hop on our website. Again, I've shared a link as well. Um, and then just for context as well, you'd want to sign up right now. But in Longmont, at the farm I manage, we'll have a seed and seedling pickup day on May 19th. And then in Boulder, you also, even if you live in Longmont, you could sign up to pick these up. Uh, and that would be May 26th as our pickup day in Boulder. Um, the classroom and community education portion of this. So, you know, Growing Gardens really has a lot of educational opportunities. And obviously during the pandemic uh, that has switched a lot of things up. So I'm gonna go over some of the online opportunities in a minute. Um, but we're really, really excited this summer and then moving forward into the fall to start up our edu educational programs at the Food Project Farm. Um, this farm is really designed for environmental and nutrition education. Uh, we run a diverse, diversified veggie farm. We have worm bins. We have bees and youth-sized bee suits, which is super fun to get the kids out working with the bees. And then also we have native pollinator and herb gardens out there as well. Um, we also will have some in-person classes, hopefully resuming this year. Things are kind of to be determined. But right now, again, I've, I've shared some links um, that you can check out afterwards. And you can always go to growinggardens.org and check out our community classes. We have five different gardening classes that you can sign up for. Three are focused on veggie gardens. And then two of them are more focused on perennials. So we've got, you know, natives and just kind of a landscaping class, um, pollinators that you want, might want to plant in your home or any landscape you have access to. And the other one is really focused on fruit trees in the front range, which are a particular challenge um, in this area with this climate. We have three cooking classes and also one beekeeping course. So onto the food project farm. Again, this is uh, the farm that I manage. This, uh, this food project farm is a collaboration between Grand Gardens and YMCA of Northern Colorado. And the YMCA actually originally started this farm and then invited Grand Gardens to um, come onto the property and help manage it. And we've been there for the last five years uh, managing this farm. And again, the goal that it was set up as and that we're continuing to manage this farm under, under this context is that we want to provide produce to the neighborhood um, as well as gardening and nutrition-based education. So everything we grow on the farm, 100% of the produce is donated to those in need locally. We don't really do direct distribution. So we have worked with Longmont WIC we're working with our center this year, um, the schools who come out and work with us or have educational programs on the farm. Um, we distribute through, through those schools as well. And um, if you have uh, an organization that you think might be a good fit, well, I'm always happy and open to talk about opportunities for where this food can go. Um, so we also, we take on uh, full season work trade volunteers. So if you are interested in getting involved in growing food locally, um, we, we have work trade volunteers um, who are gonna be with us all season and those signups are currently open. 
And if you participate, it's two hours a week and you get a CSA share through participating. Uh, we also take corporate and group volunteer groups as well. So if you're interested in checking this out and you have a group um, or you're an individual, pre, uh, re, please do reach out to me. So um, I know that James was talking a lot about growing techniques um, and I just kind of want to affirm, you know, we're doing all those things. So that makes a lot of sense, everything he said to me. Um, I wanted to point out a couple of things. In the photo on the top right, you can see a row cover. And this is a tool that we use this early in the spring. And just knowing again that the climate is really variable. Um, this is something you can get at a local garden store, which will typically catch most frosts that fall on your plants and, and stress them out, like he mentioned. Um, so I'd recommend getting a row cover. Um, another thing is being water wise. We have such a dry climate, so you can end up using a lot of water in growing food, but using drip irrigation uh, it's probably one of the best ways to deliver water right to your plants and then use mulch that'll trap that water in the soil uh, rather than letting it evaporate under the heat. Uh, also diversity is best for you and the soil. So plant flowers, plant cover crops, um, and finally share the bounty. Um, you know, everyone loves good, healthy, fresh local food. And, um, you know, so I think everyone will appreciate it if you're able to, to share. So finally, the Cultiva Youth Project. This is a high school program that we run at the Food Project Farm here in Longmont. We have eight to 10 teens who participate. They get summer job experience. They also take home CSA shares and they help run the, run the farm two shifts a week. And so it's a balance of work and education experience for those teens that participate. Um, that application is also open right now and we our closing applications on April 18th. Um, everybody loves animals and goats, so I figured this is actually happening in Boulder. Uh, Mountain Flower Goat Dairy has joined the Growing Gardens team, but uh, if you wanted to um, see some goats or hang out with them, uh, you, can, you can reach out and they do some weekend open visits to hang out with some goats who are super cute. So getting involved, um, if you want free season seedlings, um, again, this is a program for low income families. Oftentimes getting involved in gardening can have some financial hurdles to get through. And so, um, but if, if you might qualify, please uh, reach out or sign up, sign up for the work trade. Um, and if you, Green Gardens also sells all of these, um, these seedlings from our Boulder site. So that's one opportunity that you can um, you can go to our Boulder plant sales coming up. Again, I've uh, linked, or I will be sharing links through Naomi um, for links to everything I've kind of mentioned in this presentation. And yeah, that's all, that's all I've got. So thanks everyone. Thank you too. Yeah, <laughs> I am super excited about the goats. I didn't know I could go play with goats and make a little play date. So that is, that is good news. <laughs> um, and we've got some links that we'll be dropping right there in the chat for, uh, for Tim and Growing Gardens. And uh, so now that we've learned uh, a little about uh, home and community gardening resources, we're going to transition into community agriculture with Sonia and Aspen Moon Farm. Great, thank you, Naomi, and thank you to Sustainable Resilient Longmont for you know, inviting me to be here. I'll just uh, start sharing my um, screen. And um, yeah, one thing, I actually got my start in agriculture, I guess you could say, um, when I was in high school, I did Cultiva at Growing Gardens. Um, so who knows where I'd be without Growing Gardens and Cultiva. <laughs> Maybe not farming right now. Um, so I am the planting crew lead at Aspen Moon Farm, and we have two locations, field locations. Uh, the first is located in Hygiene, um, and the second one is located in Niwot. And in, we grow um, a good amount of vegetables and flowers and corn for cornmeal, as well as wheat for um, wheat berries for wheat and then raspberries as well. 
So um, the farm was uh, started in 2009 by the owners, Jason and Aaron, who are still running it. And it was um, certified USA Organic in 2012. And um, since the beginning in 2009, um, we've been biodynamic and kind of near the end, I'll talk a little bit more about what that means and what that looks like for us. So um, here, uh, starting out right now, um, a lot of my time is spent working in the greenhouse. And so here's a photo of the greenhouse and what it looks like um, a few days ago. And I kind of like to think of the greenhouse as like the mitochondria um, of the farm. So we start um, a lot of our plant starts and then the plants that go out to the field in our greenhouse. Um, so direct seeding. And then as those seeds get bigger and bigger, um, we transplant them into either small containers to sell or um, slightly larger containers that we can bring out to the field. Um, so as you can see on, um, we have raspberries that came from the field. So raspberries produce um, so much that we would have to take those raspberries out at the end of the, or at the beginning of the season anyways. And so um, that's something that we, we sell. And then um, a lot of the produce um, that grows out of the field, we also have um, some amount that goes to uh, the farm stand and other markets as well. Um, so we have the greenhouse and so those tiny baby plants. I love um, watching them grow and get bigger. It's a really awesome and cool process um, being able to see that happen every day. And um, we also love um, being able to sell plant starts to people. I think it's a really cool connection between um, eating food, but then also um, being able to grow plant starts that people can grow in their own yard. And that might be um, a yard as uh, James was talking about, or that may be a container um, or something small as well. So um, here is uh, from the farm stand actually just taken today. <laughs> this is what we're uh, selling and I'll talk a little more soon about some of those other places to find us as well. Um, but we're excited to be at the farm stand and at the Boulder Farmers Market too. And we love also talking with people. Um, so uh, about what kind of location they have and um, where what the requirements are for growing. Um, and we also like to um, have plants available that when they're ready to plant. So um, James was talking about some of those uh, cooler weather plants. Um, those are the ones that we have available. Uh, minus basil because everyone loves basil <laughs> and it can easily be grown um, in in a container inside as well. So the plant sales for home gardeners. Um, first is the Boulder Farmers Market. We actually started uh, going last week. That's a picture of us at the corner. Um, that happens every Saturday from 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. And right now we're selling everything um, from uh, spinach from the field and spicy green mix and lettuce mix um, from a hoop houses. And then we also have some cornmeal and um, wheat um, from last year's production. Um, we also have seeds that we're selling so people are able to take those and of course start growing on their own. And then our farm stand um, and also we have online orders. So people are able to order online and then pick up at the farm stand. Uh, the farm stand hours are a little bit variable, um, just kind of weather dependent. We hope to be open usually on Wednesdays and Thursdays, but of course, if we get a big snow, <laughs> so we're going to be closed. Um, and we hope to be open on in on Saturdays in May, and then our normal hours throughout the summer are Tuesday through Friday from 11 a.m. till 6 p.m. Um, and it's really nice. It's outside. Um, people, I remember last year, definitely said they really love being able to be outside and uh, shop for their vegetables at the same time. So that's, um, yeah, still a cool opportunity this summer as well. Um, so kind of transitioning back to Aspen Moon Farm and what we're doing out in the field right now. So um, a lot of our crops, uh, some of them are direct seeded. So here's um, one of our planters, one of our seeders. Um, and you can see in the picture right behind the two big wheels um, are the seeds coming out. So we have um, two rows of seeds coming out here. And so a lot of um, 
crops that have been planted so far um, are carrots and radishes, um, some of those root vegetables. And then if uh, they weren't um, planted by seed, we also um, transplanted into the field. Uh, this was taken last Thursday, and it's a big team uh, going out into the field. And we have, of course, the tractor, two people taking the plant starts from the greenhouse and then putting them in dibble in the holes um, that the tractor makes. And then two people behind um, or more. <laughs> we have a big crew uh, filling up those holes and um, planting. And then we have a whole other crew coming behind us with drip tape and irrigation and irrigating the crops. And then we put a row cover on top of that as well. Um, so that's kind of the process for uh, what planting looks like right now. And yeah, it's honestly a lot of fun. <laughs> um, I definitely love uh, going out there. And it's so cool to see the process from, from the greenhouse to planting in the field. Um, and then of course, watching it grow. And then eventually, um, we'll be able to harvest <laughs> um, soon for uh, our CSA. So CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And for us as farmers, um, a CSA program is really awesome because we get um, part of the money for the um, upfront. Um, so we can start buying, you know, equipment, seeds, um, and there's just a lot of upfront costs for farming. Um, so for us, that's kind of an investment in, and then on um, everyone else's side, on your guys' side, um, you will get a share, either a weekly share or an every other week share. Um, and there's a couple of different locations we have that can be picked up. Uh, one of them um, is at the farm located in Hygiene, off of Hygiene Road. So that's on Tuesdays and Wednesdays or Thursdays and Fridays. Um, there's also a Boulder pickup and a Denver pickup as well. Um, so basically when you come to your location between those uh, time periods, you'll just say your name and then you'll be given a whole bag full of veggies uh, depending on the season and what we're what we're growing. And um, you can choose between a small, which is $25 a week, a regular, which is $35 and a large, which is $45 a week. And um, it is a lot of vegetables and we also have like a customizable share and so you can decide each week um hey i really like carrots a lot great you know i'll try to give you as many carrots as we can um so yeah that's our csa program and um uh just a little bit like a background about organic and biodynamic farming and what that looks like for us um one aspect of that is um the animals that we have at the farm as well. So we have um, cows, as you can see a picture of, um, sheep and chickens as well. And so we take all of that manure um, that comes from the animals as well as scraps from the farm and other, basically other uh, aspects of the farming that we aren't able to use and we make compost out of it. Um, and then that compost goes back into the soil um, to grow more vegetables each year. So that's one component of it. Um, another component of the biodynamic side is basically um, taking all of the vegetables that we grow and thinking about them as either we're eating the roots of them as carrots, eating the flowers of them, um, such as broccoli, eating leaf vegetables, such as um, kale or chard or a fruit vegetable. And then um, we plant and transplant on certain days, depending on when is more favorable for each of those crops. Um, so that's a little calendar on the bottom. And then we also do crop rotation. So if we had tomatoes in one location, the next year we're gonna have um, a leaf or a root vegetable. And the idea behind that is, or one of the ideas behind that is um, that if there's pests, in one area instead of just being able to continue eating that crop um, we're putting a different crop there um, as well as each crop has um, different nutrients that it supplies and also different nutrients that it takes from the soil as well so that's kind of just helping um, with that sustainability of of the land and of the farm and then we also do cover cropping um, so usually in the fall or the spring we'll plant um, an amount of uh, a crop that we don't actually harvest that actually just goes back into the soil and back into um, nutrients for the next crop that is going to grow there. Um, so thank you everyone for listening. Um, we have our website if you just have any 
questions or interested in the CSA or the farm stand hours um, or anything else, um, the website is awesomemoonfarm.com. And then they'll also have information on what plant starts we have and seeds um, that we're going to have available. And then you're also welcome to email us at info at aspenmoonfarm.com. So uh, yeah, thank you everyone. And I hope you have um, a bountiful uh, year and season. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, I love seeing the pictures of the planting and, and doing the row cover, the whole like kind of system you have set up. And I was one of those people who really needed to get outside last year and was so <laughs> happy to visit the farm scene and that's where we met. So I'm very much looking forward to that again this year. Well, thank you. And uh, just a reminder for our Zoom attendees, you can put any questions you have for our panelists in the Q&A form, and we will answer some of them live at the end. Um, and now Brian is going to share some additional information about the Boulder County Farmers Markets and their network of local growers. Great. Thank you, Naomi. Well, welcome, everybody. And now that you've seen three really beautiful visual presentations, it is time as Monty Python said for something completely different. So I'm gonna to talk to you about, or talk with you about Boulder County Farmers Markets and the role that, that we can play in your consideration of growing and how you grow for yourself. And I think I would first start with something that Sonia said, which is that in my experience, farmers really appreciate gardeners. Uh, you might be inclined to assume that somehow farmers at the market or their farm stand are at odds with gardeners because if you're growing your own food, you're not buying their food. But the truth is food is really hard to grow. And I think it's most valued by those people who have experienced both sides of it. So gardeners make excellent customers. And uh, as James said, the market is a great place to find diversity and learn what else you might want to grow. There are a number of farmers at the markets who do sell starts. So Aspen Moon is in fact, one of our probably larger provider of starts at the market, but we also have Rocky Mountain Fresh provides starts. Uh, Weeby Farms, Karen specializes in garlic but she also does early season plant starts, tomato, lettuce, kale, those kinds of things, uh, as well as seed garlic later. And uh, Miller Farms provides tomato plants. Gail grows it, has been in the Boulder market for years. And she has had plants of all kinds, whether they're vegetable starts or raspberry bushes or some pretty exotic kind of woodsy plants. Uh, she's no longer at the market this year, but she will be selling online. We do have an online curbside function now. And then finally, McConnell and Sons is another start provider that comes to mind. And uh, there is, of course, Home Depot and Lowe's and some of our local nurseries. And so there, I think a lot of people have a question of like, why would I get starts from a local farmer? And there's a really good answer to that. Uh, one of the most important of which is that your local farmers tend to provide starts that they know grow well in Colorado conditions. And in many cases, some of those seeds or some of the starts come from seeds that they've cultivated themselves. And so they're more or less hardened in some way and they have a high success rate in this environment. Uh, I do want to say that as like Aspen Moon sells seeds, there are other organizations that sell seeds. One of the most notable is the Masa Seed Foundation. And uh, Rich Pecoraro runs the Masa Seed Foundation. He's, he's a phenomenal grower. He's been in this area for decades. And his mission is to develop a bioregional food bank. So he really works on seeds that are entirely suitable to this kind of environment. Uh, and as you've heard from some of these other speakers, uh, that becomes really important because there are a lot of temperature swings, there are drought conditions, there's various things that make it hard to grow vegetables here. Uh, so please do check out Masa Seed, check out the Aspen Moon Seeds. And yeah, you can go with Johnny Seed or something like that, but um, I think there's a lot of advantage in going local. 
Same thing with the starts and uh, also you're going to be able to bug the farmer. I gotta say, this is a great time. Uh, let's see, so I don't know that I'm gonna say that farmers like being bothered, but I will say that customer interaction is not a bother to them because like most of us, they love to talk about their craft and they love the fact that people find it meaningful. This early season is a really good time often to find a farmer who has some time to talk about why do you grow this variety versus that variety? And, and I want to get some plant starts. How exactly should I do this? When should they go in the ground? Where should I keep them in the meantime? How much water do they have? They'll have time for you right now because the markets are not quite as busy. And Sonia, I'm guessing the same is true for the farm stands. Uh, still early season, so it's not quite as crowded. We do have our Longmont Saturday market that started last week. Our Boulder Saturday market started last week. May 5th, we will be starting our Boulder Wednesday market. May 8th, if you are listening and you're in Denver, the Union Station Farmers Market will start up on Mother's Day weekend, which is May 8th. And we're hoping to start the Lafayette market this year. We didn't do it last year because of the pandemic. If we do start the Lafayette market this year, it'll be in mid-July when there's an abundance and we hope to capture people's enthusiasm for being back outdoors and, and hitting it hard. And I think that there will be some contact information that's provided via this this session and please reach out. I'm happy to direct you and help you in any way that I can. Awesome, thank you so much, Brian, for all that you do to support our local, local growers and sharing all this information about how they're such great resources for our community. Um, so we've got about 15, 10, 10 to 15 minutes for some Q&A and we've got some questions coming in. So let's ask our local growers we have right here some of this uh, wonderful uh, resources we have right in front of us right now. So um, some questions about things to grow in this region. Um, is it possible at all to grow sour cherry trees in Colorado? And if so, where can one find sour cherry farmers? Does anyone know about sour cherry <laughs> farming and growing in this region? I'll take a crack at it. Uh, I've, not because I grow, but I've lived in Boulder County now for 45 years and sour cherries are probably the only kind of cherry you're going to find down at this elevation. So they're not at all uncommon. The most difficult part of growing sour cherries here are the birds. So trying to just keep the fruit from being consumed by the birds, but uh, you can probably, I, I would recommend Harlequin Gardens. Michael up there is an amazing resource for this kind of information, and he can direct, definitely direct you to good varieties and growing practices for those, and they are in North Boulder. Great, thank you. Um, so Catherine asks, I've separated my gardens into annual veggies and a perennial edible section. Can you suggest some edible perennials? I've got asparagus, rhubarb, grapes, raspberries, a cherry tree, a blackberry started. So any other perennial veggies you can recommend? It's open to any of our growers, I suppose. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I didn't remember the whole list off the top of my head. I, I know a lot of people have a lot of success with strawberries around here, which are pretty good. Uh, they last for several years. Um, currants are also um, pretty successful in the front range. And, you know, one of the challenges, again, with growing fruit in the front range is you can grow it and the plant will grow. But oftentimes with these early warm days, um, it'll wake these trees up and we will get, you know, those late end of April into May, those snowstorms. And so a lot of the fruit varieties will, um, when they're flowering, they've woken up, they'll flower and they'll get hit with these cold swings. So um, a lot of the fruit trees and, and, and things that will flower early, like apples and cherries will grow well, but they won't produce every year. They'll produce every few years when the, 
the climate is forgiving, the seasonal storms are forgiving. So um, aside from those, um, I'd recommend growing a lot of herbs. You know, your herbs are perennials. And I, th I think you put a few in the list, but I think there, there's probably a couple more you can find. Um, those are my thoughts. Naomi, if I may add uh, to Tim's point, this area used to have a copious amount of apple orchards and you'll still see references to developments that refer to the old apple orchards. Uh, and the only real apple grower I'm aware of anymore is really further east where they tend to get some of the warm weather earlier in East uh, Colorado. So uh, because of the weather swings, it's only getting harder and harder. And in fact, our Western slope fruit growers are starting to remove their trees that are early and late season and replace them with mid season trees because those late and early temperature swings are killer on uh, it, literally killing the bud of the uh, fruit before it can grow. All right, uh, we have a question about watering. So sprinkler system or drip irrigation for a home garden. What do you use, James? Drip irrigation, all the way. Drip irrigation is the best way, if you can swing it. It's a little, more expensive to set up up front and it takes a little bit more work but once you get it set up it's really easy and you can even install a timer on your outdoor uh, spigot so you don't even have to think about it just the timer clicks on and you set the how long it runs for half an hour however long you want and then it clicks off so it's really easy and as tim was saying it helps a lot just with efficiency Vegetables really only need the water to go to the roots. So the drip irrigation does that. Um, I always tell people like with a sprinkler system, it's kind of like if someone is trying to give you a glass of water by pouring water on your head. And you know, it, some of the water will get in your mouth, but it's more efficient if you just drink it straight, you know, straight into your mouth. So the vegetables are the same way. You just want to give them you know, the roots of their mouth. So you just want to give them the water at the roots. So drip irrigation helps you do that. Awesome. Thank you. I love that analogy. <laughs> You've got a lot of great analogies, James. Um, so about soil now, what soil additions are useful here in Longmont in addition to compost or aged manure? How can we test our soil and be sure what we need? I'm all about compost for me. Um, I make homemade compost and I just add it to the soil. I do uh, do soil tests each year. For me, I take a soil sample uh, once in the fall and I send it up to CSU um, just to kind of keep an eye on things. And so I can, so CSU, let me backtrack for a minute. CSU has a soil lab. So you can get these little plastic vials and you, take samples from your soil from a bunch of different spots, put it, uh, mix it all together in a jar, shake it up, let it sit out and air dry for a little bit. And then you put it in this vial and send it up to CSU. And a few weeks later, they'll send you the soil test results. And they'll also give you uh, suggestions of what, how you can improve the soil and things of that nature. Um, but for me, I'm all about just doing as or, you know, organic and beyond organic as I can. So I just make compost. Um, yeah. And while we're talking about soil, a related question, how do you get your soil ready? Um, you talked a little bit about additions and also I guess, Sonia, if you wanna talk a little bit about what that process is like at the farm and, and what any additions you might put into the soil as well. Yeah, definitely. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I think uh, definitely at a smaller scale and at our larger scale as well, we do the soil preparation. So um, just from transitioning from uh, winter to spring is um, like we use tractors, but you can definitely just use, you know, a shovel or um, a pitchfork. It doesn't have to be anything super fancy um, to uh, start to aerate the soil and that might be adding compost to the top of your soil if you're going to add compost or anything else and then mix that compost into your soil 
um, and and then be able to um, start planting. So it um, and then as James talked about as well, if you want to get a soil test, um, that's useful to know in the spring or fall as well of where your soils add and what nutrients or added nutrients it might um, need as well. Okay, there's a question about uh, the need to plant flowers um, and, and using flowers as either maybe intercropping, keeping pests away or pollinators. Um, hoping to start out my backyard with flowers, bushes, non-producing trees. Is this something that local farmers can advise on and or provide seeds or seedlings for? I see you unmuted there, James. I'll, I'll, let, you, I'll let you chime in. Uh... Okay. Uh, so yeah, I would say I use marigolds. Marigolds are great for this. Um, so I interplant marigolds throughout the yard. I also do herbs. So uh, I always think of this as anything that it just smells really good. That tends to repel a lot of pests. So uh, marigolds, mint, um, lavender, anything like that. And you can just plant it sporadically throughout your vegetables and that should help to keep a lot of pests away. But marigolds are the main ones that I use. Do you have any others, Tim? Yeah, I think um, I just, I appreciate the question a lot because I think as growers, farmers, really what we are are landscape managers. And so while growing food is one very important component of managing a landscape, um, people are not the only, the only inhabitants of this landscape. So when you can have marigolds or around your home garden space, add these perennials or, or annual flowers, um, I think of really like, how am I benefiting the pollinators in the area? Um, similarly, like James said, a lot of these plants are going to be attracting beneficial insects. Um, some of your vegetables, if they're fruit vegetables, they need those pollinators. Um, and similarly, if it's another um, brassicas, for example, are a plant family of cabbage, arugula, turnips. So there's a lot of kale, there's a lot of vegetables in there. They have their own scent that attract a lot of pests. So um, any flowers you can find, I, I think are really great to add in. Um, marigolds are a great one. I like to throw zinnias and cosmos. They're, they're easy. They, you cut the flower, you get to take them inside for a vase, and that promotes more flower growth. Um, any of your herbs, a lot of those herbs are really going to go to flower. Um, and as I look at my home garden and home landscape, what I'm looking for actually during the year are moments when there are not flowers growing out there. And then that's an opportunity for me to fit a plant in. I'll go look for, hey, what's flowering now? Um, and go to a nursery, plant nursery, and find out what's going to be flowering right now. I'm lacking in my landscape support. So um, that's kind of the, the mindset that I have and that I would recommend um, for you all. And then there was an addendum about um, whether local farms maybe sell seeds for flowers or starters. Do you know about that, Sonia or Brian? Yeah. Go ahead, Sonia. You're you're gonna have the broadest view on this. Cool. Yeah, I was um just gonna say for flowers um, at Aspen Moon, we do sell um, a variety of different flowers um, and. Uh, some of those flowers that we do sell from seed um, include baby's breath and bells of Ireland, um, blanket flower, and blepleurum, syrinth, and dill. Um, and like the dill, also the herb as well, the same, <laughs> same one. It makes really cool. You can put it in like bouquets and stuff as well. Um, and then safflower and scabiosa ping pong variety. Um, so yeah, those are some that we found at the farm stand and um, farmer's market as well. Awesome, thank you. Um, let's see, 
Speaking of pests, some larger pests, tricks for keeping squirrels out of your garden or cats from pooping in the garden, uh, anything to deal with some larger critters. Oh, I think this is why uh, farmers always used to carry a 22 in their truck. Um, but I, I know that that's not what we're talking about here. So I'll, I'll let James throw in on how he manages it. Yeah, so I don't, I don't really have any good suggestions for this. Um, aside from just diversity seems to be really key. Uh, so in my yard, I have a ton of squirrels that live in the trees and they run the fence line all the time and a bunch of birds too. And they all, for some reason, stay away from the vegetables, even the strawberries. And I have no idea why. Um, yeah, I don't have a dog or anything. Maybe my my neighbor's dog might help keep them away, uh, but even on the part that's far away. So I think just diversity is really key and just, you know, planting as much as you can. And yes, a squirrel will snag a strawberry here and there, but last year there was a boatload that they didn't get. So I'd say diversity. You'll notice that none of us jumped at this question because it's not, it's not a fun one and there's not always a great answer. Um, you know, and the one that I'm thinking about right now is, is cats that was mentioned. Cats aren't really gonna go for your garden vegetables, um, but they might be looking for other mice around. And so just keeping your landscape clean of um, hiding places, places that might breed rodents and stuff, um, can go a long way to keeping all of all those critters out as well. Awesome. Well, we have a couple of questions that we might be able to answer in the chat as we're wrapping up, but I wanted to hop back to one of the questions that was asked earlier about uh, effective use of cover crops, um, about plants coexisting with your veggies or are they turned underground before planting your veggies and how do you use cover crops? Um, so maybe we could answer that live. I had, I had um, chatted a quick response to that. Um, I would say that I have some experience and in really short order, it's um, summer crops are gonna go in around, you know, June 1st or end of May. And I try to grow a cover crop before other crops, um, you know, if you plant a bed of carrots and then it's in there for most of the season, you have a tail end, I'm trying to get a cover crop in that's a strategy that I'm using a lot, but um, to be totally honest, Aspen Moon, I think is gonna have the most um, and probably best experience around cover crops. Um, not to put you on the spot, Sonia, if you wanna chime in, I think you guys are um, have a good reputation around that. Cool, yeah, yeah no, thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, I would say for cover cropping at the farm, we definitely try to have um, cover crops um, in the fall and then in the spring as well and then also have periods and in the cycle as well of rest periods where even for a year we won't be planting in the field at all and just growing cover crops and so um, I think definitely on you know on one side it feels like a sacrifice to part of a land that isn't growing vegetables but I think it's you know kind of looking at that shorter term versus longer term um aspect of in the short term um we're not growing vegetables but in the longer term being able to provide nutrients um for the soil and make healthier soil um and so i think for gardeners as well you know that could be something of thinking of having certain areas and having a rotation um, even in a small area it doesn't have to be i think a really big area or different you know pots or something like that to using those um as well. So I think that can be applied on a bigger scale and then a smaller scale as well. Thank you, Sonia. So I think that's all the time we're going to have for Q&A today. Clearly, we could talk about local growing for quite a while longer. Uh, but if you have further questions about home gardening, James and Tim have provided their contact info for our Grow Local resource document, which I will be uh, posting on the website later and emailed out to everyone who registered. So I'm gonna just share a couple closing slides. Um, 
As I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, I'm the Executive Director of Longmont Food Rescue, and this summer we are again collecting donations from home and community gardeners and redistributing them to those facing food insecurity in the Longmont area. So we invite you to grow a row for LFR. Download the Fresh Food Connect app where your, um, <clears throat> and then when your extra row is producing food or if you finally find yourself with too many tomatoes or a ton of zucchini all at once this summer, you just add your produce to the app and one of our courier volunteers will pick it up from your doorstep. It's a really easy way to donate any extra food you find yourself with this growing season. And that's about it for our spring Grow Local webinar. All the links we shared today in today's webinar will be compiled into that resource guide that I mentioned, which will be posted with the full video on our website and emailed out to everyone who registered through Zoom. This guide will also include some extra goodies like our panelists' favorite recipes uh, for locally grown produce this spring and links to other gardening webinars from the city of Longmont. If you would like to get involved with Sustainable Resilient Longmont and the Zero Waste Committee, there will be links in the Zoom chat for that. As I mentioned earlier, our annual Longmont Earth Day celebration is coming up on Saturday, April 24th, and there will be family programming for youth and teens from 10 a.m. till 3, and an evening panel on equitable climate action from 6.30 to 8.30. You can find more information and register for that on our website. We are a community run nonprofit and rely on donations and grants. So if you're able to donate, we deeply appreciate your support. Thank you everyone who joined us for this webinar and a huge thank you to our panelists, James, Tim, Sonia, and Brian, and now guest panelists, the cat, <laughs> and for all the information and expertise you shared with us today. We hope you have a bountiful growing season this year. Thank you.